In this video, we're going to go over the second chapter of Excel and go through the learning objectives of chapter two, which is focusing on formulas and functions. This is the textbook case example that I would encourage everybody to have a look through because the assessments that you're going to be doing are based very similar to these. Now, my lecture today will be based similar uh, learning objectives, but a different example. So we'll be taking a look at uh, different ways of building these formulas and functions using relative, absolute, and mixed cell referencing. We'll be looking at how to look at different variety of functions, statistical, mathematical, date, etc., as well as logical functions, uh, vertical lookups, um, financial formulas like payments, and even a condition statement to get you uh, exposed to how conditional functions work. So I've put uh, an example together for this chapter, which is my, my regular lecture, which is going to be an, a quantitative analysis for purchasing a house. And I, I've selected this uh, topic because I find that students are sometimes interested in knowing what's involved and how to do a proper quantitative analysis if you want to buy a home. So that's what I'll be doing here for the chapter number two. Now, if we uh, open up, uh, I'll open up my uh, second um, lecture, which is um, called Buy a House. Uh, last week we did one on your personal budget. And this week we're going to do one on buying a house or to buy a house. So there's a lot of components when you, a lot of variables and to, to do a proper analysis and to really see what the costs are going to be and what, if you can afford it. Uh, Excel is a great tool for doing these quantitative analysis. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go over and uh, put in an actual practical example at the time of this recording and uh, show you as many different variable inputs that I can to, to try to come up with the best results so you can understand how to do one of these. All right, so to get started, uh, you can follow along. So you could watch this on your iPad or your, or your phone and you could start working along with me in Excel to go through this. So to get started, uh, you can put in a title at the top, you know, buy a house analysis as a quantitative a house analysis to buy it. And what I've done here is I've, I've located uh, a house that's actually for sale. And I've also put in hyperlinks. Now, uh, this is just to make things easier for the sake of this video. And if you were building a system that needed to access external sources, you can put in hyperlinks. So for example, under the address of the house that I'm looking at, I put in a link here, and this is the one I'm going to use for this example. It's near Douglas College, uh, New West Campus, and it's being currently asked, or they're currently asking $379,900 for. Now, when you look for a house, a lot of times they'll have, you know, estimate payments, and they'll, they'll give you a little bit of the data, but it really isn't a comprehensive qualitative, quantitative analysis. So they're going to say that it's going to cost you $1,180 to buy this place. Well, that's really not accurate because there's so many other variables that you need to consider um, when you're doing this because a lot of people will make uh, choices with their variables when they're purchasing how much they put down what their amortization schedule is what type of mortgage they want to select etc so there's a lot more involved than just that so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through this in a sort of a systematic way i've got the data here and i'm going to explain it and you can just follow along and enter it in as we go all right, so I put in the address of this particular one, and, and sometimes I do an analysis, I'll have actually multiple addresses. I'll, I'll ana analyze multiple properties, and this same concept would work uh, if you wanted to do multiple. I'm just gonna do one analysis here. All right, so the first and the most important input data would be the asking price. How much are they asking for the house? Well, as you saw from the um, example up here, they're asking, 379.90. All right, so that's right. We're going to enter that in here. Now, I also put in what they refer to as the assessed value. This is the value that the city deems that the property is worth. And, and that's a, kind of a subjective amount because it's not that accurate. This is just a, a guesstimate, you might say. But I do put in a link here for that as well. So I'm going to just open that link up here. And this is the that's the website. Let me open up the BC assessment. There it is. So this is what they call BC assessment, talking about how much the property is valued. So they say at the 
at the time of this recording, it's valued at actually more than they're asking, which is always um, a good sign. If you're buying a property you're below what they're asking or the assessment is, that's a good sign. But there could be a lot of reasons for that. Now, the next variable I want to put in here is the accepted offer. If I make an offer uh, and they accept it, let's run through the scenario and do a, a proper quantitative analysis on that amount. Now we can simply go in here and change this. We can always play what if. What if we change it to, you know, 380,000, even more than they're asking, which sometimes happens. You know, everything changes in the system. But um, I'm not going to do that for this example. I'm going to make a lower offer than they're asking, just a little bit. So I'm going to discount it. So I want to calculate how much am I going to discount their offer? This is valuable information for me when I make a decision. Now you'll notice that the color changes here. I've changed it from green to just no no background color. And the reason for that is everything in green are my decisions as a as an individual, and everything in that doesn't have green is a, a formula or function of some sort. So chapter two really focuses on how to write formulas functions. So this one right here, as we talked in, in last week's in chapter one, how to write a simple formula. Well, if I want to calculate the discount, how much am I discounting the property? I would simply do that by taking how much they're asking and subtract it from how much I'm offering. So if the, the, the difference would be $4,900. If you look at, if I double click on the cell, it says, let's take C4 and subtract it from C6, which is a basic simple uh, calculation. So it's basically, I'm going to offer $4,900 less than they want, which isn't too bad. Now, it's also probably a good idea to put that in a percentage format. So I'm going to calculate how much percentage am I asking as a discount? I want a 1.29% discount off of this, which isn't a lot. I mean, it seems to be in a reasonable amount. So the reason I put these formulas in here is that when I'm putting in an offer, an accepted offer, and I could probably put a little highlight around that just this one right here is really the the big number, right? Because these all these other numbers are kind of fixed. But this number here is the number that I'm controlling. So I'll put maybe a, a brighter green there. All right, so how do you calculate the reduced offer? Well, you simply want to calculate it by taking what their price is. So they're asking $379.9 minus what I offered and divide it by what they originally offered. So that would be the formula for calculating the reduced offer price. And that's how you write a formula. So there's no functions here. This is strictly just taking numbers, doing mathematical calculations to come up with the answer. All right. So it's a 1.29. Now the next one I've got here is called the down payment percentage. So what that means is what percentage am I going to uh, put down? And I put this as a, an input again, because this is my uh, I can decide how much I want to put down on purchasing a house. I could say, well, I want 15%. I could put 10%. Or oh, I could put 5%. All right. Or I could put, you know, 60%, whatever I wanted. I could put that number in here. And again, that's my number. I can control that. So again, I could probably just, just to put in, to make it emphasize a little more, the dark green is really my variables. All right. So I'm going to put down... Uh, let's say 20%. And when I click in 20%, it tells me how much cash that I'm going to have to come up with to purchase this property. So I need to have saved up $75,000 if I'm going to put down 20%. So that's, um, that's a significant amount of money. Now, sometimes we don't have enough cash to purchase it. And sometimes we need to have a second mortgage. Now you don't have to, you can put down that you want uh, to put down zero. Okay. So I'm going to put zero there. And that's, you just go on to base it on not having any other money coming in. Sometimes you get a second mortgage from a bank or maybe family or friends can lend you some money. Um, so it's really, this is just a, another variable to calculate. So I'm going to just say, I'm going to put down, you know, 50, I got $50,000, let's say from a family or friend member. And that's about 13% that we're going to put down. So I'm putting 75 myself. I'm going to borrow a little bit. And again, that's a variable that I'm controlling. So I'm going to make it really bright green there. Just so I know all the bright green are my variables that I can change to play my what if scenarios. And then what I want to do is I want to calculate how much my mortgage is going to be. So my mortgage 
is how much the bank is going to loan me to buy this house. Well, I've got $75,000 for my part. My second is 50000 and I made a, an offer, an accepted offer of three seventy-five. So we want to calculate how much the bank is going to have to loan us to buy this house. So we, it's, again, it's, this is a formula. So another formula would simply be taking how much we want, uh, how much the original mortgage is, how much they accepted our offer for, which is three seventy-five, and we're going to subtract it from our first down payment, which is seventy-five, and subtract it from the fifty thousand. All right, so push enter and we come up with, we need a mortgage of a quarter million dollars. All right, so from there, we now can go to the bank and say, we need a quarter million dollars to purchase this house. Well, the bank is gonna ask us some questions like, well, what kind of mortgage do you want? So again, this is our choice. So I'm gonna change that color and I can make a choice of what rate I want. Now you'll notice over here, I've got a hyperlink. And when I click on the hyperlink, it takes me to the my bank's uh, rate page. So it'll open up how much the rates are. Here's the mortgage rate. So I'm, I'm getting mortgage rates right from, you know, my bank website. So it's very important to have accurate data to do a properly qualified analysis. So I could go in here and say on a, this is approved uh, credit rating, um, annual percentage rate, sorry, <laughs> the annual percentage rate. So that means every year you have to pay 1.82% if you choose a mortgage that's two years fixed. It's closed. So you just pay that for 24 months and that's the rate you'll get. So I put that in here and I've got a choice. So again, I can select any of these in right here. And you think, well, why wouldn't you select the lowest one, right? That makes sense. But there's pros and cons to each and there's risks to each. And what Excel can help you do is analyze the risks and tell you how much the extras are so you can make a better decision. Without doing a proper analysis, you're making a decision based on a guess, which is something that you definitely don't want to do when you're, when you're buying one of the most important things that we all buy in our lives if we buy real estate. All right, so this is a really big decision. And so what I'm doing now is I'm going to make a, do an analysis on my mortgage. So what I've done is I've taken my my bank's mortgage site and I put the, the link up here again, and I've copied the data here. Now the data is static. That means that I've copied it at the time of this recording. Rates can technically change uh, from during the day or from day to day. So these rates really are not uh, dynamic. So you need to be able to, well, first of all, check your rate to make sure that that's the correct rate. Or later when we start getting into uh, importing data, we can actually connect this and make a live link, but that's beyond the scope of today's class. So well, all I've done here is I've gone into my mortgage. So I've, I've opened up the mortgage here. I just select all this. I copied it and I simply just pasted it back into here. All right, so that gave me these rates here. Now, from there, I want to uh, be able to use these. Now, I can just, for at this point now, I can just guess at one of these. I can say, well, I want to take this one here. Let's say it's uh, 1.32. And I type in 1.32%, which would be a five-year variable close. That means that the rates fluctuate for five years and you can't get out of that mortgage. So if the rates really spike high, you're going to end up paying a lot more mortgage. But at the time, they're very low right here to try to get you into the mortgage. So there's a lot of pros and cons and you really need to analyze this and we can do that in Excel. All right, the next thing we can do is we can decide how many years that we want to pay this mortgage off. And again, that is our under our control. They refer to this as the term. How much time is it going to take you to pay back this mortgage? The other thing is you can decide when you get a mortgage is your payments per year. So payments per year is uh, usually pay once a month. That's probably the most common, but you can also pay bi-weekly, uh, uh, semi-monthly. There's different options. Look, basically 12 would be monthly because there's 12 months in a year. If you did 26, that would be bi-weekly. Every two weeks you would pay. So you pay a little, you pay more often, which has a slightly different outcome on how the calculations work. But for the sake of this example today, I'm going to stick with pay monthly because it's probably the easiest, but we put the variable in here because we want to have that option to see how it, it actually plays out. 
All right. Now what we want to do is we want to keep track of how much our family money that we're, we're putting in. So we said here we're going to put down $50,000 from a family member or get a, a second mortgage. And that number is actually the same as this number here. So we've got a duplication in data. Now we could either take this out or we could dynamically link these two cells together. And the reason I put this in is to show you an example of how to dynamically bring data. So if I want this number to always be the same as this number, what I do is I simply start off with an equal key and I simply type in the field. So that's what they refer to as a cell reference or link. And that means that anytime in the future, if I type in, let's say 75,000 here, you'll notice down here, it automatically links and makes whatever this cell is equal to this cell. Very handy tool to know. All right, so this one here, because it's automated and it's now no longer an input, I don't really want a format. So I'm gonna turn that off just so I know I don't have to bother with changing that one right there. All right, the next one is a list of variables that people need to consider when they're purchasing. For example, an appraisal. When you purchase a house or a property, it's a good idea to get an appraisal on the property to make sure what you're paying is, is within the right range. Now we've got a little bit of understand we have an assessed value. That's one way we can figure it out. We can also look at comparables. It's another way to do it. But by getting a third party to come in and do a proper analysis on it, that's, that's another good way to do it. And sometimes banks force you to get one of these and they cost about a thousand dollars. So I'm going to type in a thousand dollars here. And again, that's my control. So I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to select um, the, my input here because I could go around to different companies and maybe you can get that a little cheaper, but they're about a thousand dollars. Now BC purchase tax. Now, a lot of people don't realize, but when you purchase a house, you have to pay tax to purchase a house, just like you pay tax by a car or to pay tax by anything nowadays. So, but how much is it? Well, it's, it's a fairly complicated formula. It's not a function, it's a formula. So what I've done is I put in a link here and the link basically will take us to the BC uh, property transfer tax page. And you can go through and see what the fees are for calculating for purchasing a property. So I've, I've kind of simplified the process a little bit by, by taking this general property transfer tax information and writing it into a formula. So this would be a good exercise to take this right here and write your own formula. I'm gonna walk you through the process, but you can see how you'd wanna be able to understand a problem like this and be able to solve it using Excel. So how am I solving it? Well, I'm going in here and I'm gonna say, well, how much do I have to pay in tax? Well, the taxes owing would be how much did you uh, buy the house for? 375,000. And then what they do is they, you have to subtract 200,000 of that because they only want, uh, they only, they, they charge 1% on the 200,000 and then 2% on everything above the 200,000. So the way I calculated this, and there's a lot of ways you could write the math to do this formula. This is just the way I chose to do it. And so I take the purchase price, which is 375 minus the 200,000, calculate that first. So you know that's going to be 175,000 multiplied by 2%. Now I could have put the 2% as a decimal or I could put in two and a percent sign. They both work. So I could have just replaced this with, let's go here and put in a 2%. It reads better. All right. And I want to add that to $2,000, um, $200,000 times 1%. And that's what uh, British Columbia charges when you buy a property. So you'd have to come up with another $5,500 just to pay the, the government for the privilege of buying a house. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's what it is. All right, let's take a look at another variable called the survey. Now, sometimes you'll have to do a survey. Now, I, I put down zero here because it's not as common, but some cases they need to do a survey if there's any kind of discrepancies or neighbor problems or something like that. So because this is a, an apartment, uh, they, we, we don't have that problem, but I put it in here in case in the future you were doing a proper quantitative analysis on a house, you could put it in. All right, legal fees. Now to purchase a, a house, you're gonna need to pay a lawyer or a notary public to process and file your name as the owner 
with the land titles and go through all that process to do that. And notaries are about 800 to 1,000, lawyers are 1,000 to $1,400. So I put down 1,200 as a sort of a, a basic amount right here. All right, so from here, another cost that people don't really think of is that when you purchase a house, you have to pay the property tax on the for the time that the house has, um, you know, since January 1st of that year. So at the time of this recording being May the 20th, you would have to pay property taxes from May the January the 1st till May the 20th. Now that is um, because the previous owner has already paid it. So you're in a sense paying them back. So how do we calculate that? And that's, that's an interesting problem. So what, first of all, you need to know is how much are the property taxes? Well, let's go back into the real estate site. And if you look down through the listing, it tells you that the property tax is $1,822. So I put that in here and I put it in as a negative because it's an expense, but you only have to pay a portion of that for the remainder of this year. So how do you calculate that down? Well, in this case, we're going to be calculating that based on a rather complicated date function formula. So if you'd have a look at what I've got here, I'm actually in, I'll go through this kind of in a, in a very uh, basic way to start off with. It basically says, let's do a calculation with figuring out where we are today. Because assuming that we were looking at, and this could, this will still change a little bit because by the time you close, will be probably a month or two after you've done this. So this will probably drop in price a little bit as well. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. So take today's date, whatever it happens to be. That's a function called the date function. It basically pulls out whatever today is. And if you notice, there's no argument in the date uh, in today function, because you can't argue today's not today because today is always today. <laughs> That's how it works now. And we want to subtract it from the date of the uh, beginning of the year. So I said in the beginning of 2021, January 1st. Now, if you think about it, the way I wrote that, it's still going to be problematic because if I run this program next year, then it won't work. So in fact, I should probably change this. January 1st is always a constant for the beginning of the year, but the year itself will change. So I could put in another function in here uh, called the year. And I could just say, well, what year is it? Well, the year is, I mean, you can't argue this year is this year and next year will you can't argue next year will be the, at the time that happens. All right. So you can see how you can modify this a little bit. Let me just uh, type that in and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do that formula. I have to rewrite that formula. I'll stick with the original and then we'll come back and we'll make a change to that. Now, if we want to calculate, we have to divide the date January the 1st, of 2021 and we divide it by 365.25 you're thinking well what's this 0.25 well to be really accurate we want to include leap year because we have to include a quarter of a year um, because every four years you have to add a day hence why we use this right here and then we multiply it by this value right there so which is b21 and there's these dollar signs and i put the dollar signs in didn't really need to those dollar signs refer to as an absolute cell reference, but we're not copying this. So we could just leave it in as it is. So what we're looking at here is that the taxes for the year are $1,822, but you, your portion would only be $693 for the year. So this is giving you more of an accurate uh, analysis of how much you're going to have to pay. You're not going to have to pay the full amount because the year has already progressed, you know, a certain amount. You're going to just be required to pay what's remaining. Now, just looking at this number though, I'm going to have to double check my math because I think my math might be a little bit off here because it seems because May isn't even 50% of the year that this number should be at least 50%. So this should be around $900. So I think my math is off a little bit, but what I'm trying to get across here is that you can use functions. So I've used the date function, the today function. I've used the date function and I've used it in all together in a formula. So formulas can consist of functions 
in a combination, but you have to follow the logic. And you can see how complicated this one's getting. Um, and I can almost tell by looking at that number, it, there's something not quite right. I'll have to redo the math and come up with the right one. In fact, if you guys want to take a look at this, work out the math, uh, that'd be great. Otherwise, I could uh, sit down and do it with you guys uh, at a later time. All right, so now the next variable is called the, the closing cost totals, or this is, should, really should be entitled the total closing cost. The closing cost means how much costs it takes to purchase the property. Well, we know the appraisal is going to cost. We know the BC tax. It could be a survey. There's legal fees. There's taxes owing. So all I'm doing is I'm using a function to sum up just my costs. And you can see I've indented this just to make sure that it's, you know, so I'm looking at around $7,000 in strictly just extra costs to purchase the property. All right. Now there is a whole nother uh, cost that you need to consider called the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation or CMHC. Now CMHC is a company that guarantees the banks that you will pay your mortgage. Remember that the bank is going to borrow you a quarter million dollars. And if for some reason you lose your job or you don't want to pay and you you just leave, the bank would be on the hook. So they're, they don't want to be on the hook. So what the bank does is they want insurance. So the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation has a guarantee process where you have to pay a certain percentage to guarantee that you will pay the bank back. I know it sounds um, ridiculous, but that's how it works. Now, if you pay over a certain percentage of your mortgage, the numbers for this change. All right, so let's have a look at that. Now, how it works is um, I've, I've put up the CMHC rate table. Now, I, I got that from CMHC website, and I put a link here, and I embedded it, and it basically says if you're going to, um, if you're going to take a loan to the value of the property of up to and including 65%, they're going to require a 0.6% um, premium on your mortgage. If you are only going to, if you're going to put down uh, up to and including 75%, or that's what you're loan borrowing, you're going to have to pay up to 1.7%. So how that works is based on how much money you're putting down. So you can see here the down payment is 20%. If I was to lower that, now watch this. Um, sorry, the, uh, basically I've taken that table we just talked about and I put it right here. So whatever the percentage is, uh, we, we're going to calculate the value. Now, how do, how does this work? Well, let's say for a moment that we put down um, ten percent. Well, ten percent down is up. You're going to finance up to ninety percent. So you're going to need uh, to pay CMEC. So once I put in 10% up here, right here under my down payment, it changes everything. It means that I have to come up with 70, uh, 37,000 and my family's going to put down maybe, um, let's go 50,000. All right. So we don't really have enough, uh, down payment to avoid paying the CMEC. So what happens is the computer will calculate how much percentage that I need to pay. And it says here that I've got to pay 3.1% because I'm at the, I'm at this one right here. I've, I've, I'm at the, uh, 85% finance rate. So that's 3.1%. And that gets entered here with the 3.1%. I have to calculate how much, um, I need to pay. So, in this scenario, I would pay an extra $8,913. So of course, people don't want to pay this. So what you want to do is by using Excel, let me just zoom out a bit here so we can see all of this, is that you want to try to come up with an amount here. So let's say 15%, oops, 15%. Let me just open these up again. And it says here, I still have to pay 2.8 because I'm putting more down. So therefore, now I go from 3.1 to 2.8. I'm going to put a little bit more in. So let's say my down payment, I'm going to put down 20%. Well, 20%, that means I got to come up with 75,000 cash. I got to put down a second 
And now, because I've, I've paid over the, um, uh, you know, that amount, I, I, I'm over 25%. I don't have to pay any CMHC. So you'll see here, CMHC uh, should disappear. Did I get that right? Let's look at how that's calculated. So if you go down to the CMHC percentage, you'll notice that there's a very, uh, there's a new function here. It's called the vertical lookup. And this is one of the um, key functions in Excel. It's usually a question sometimes when you go for a job interview, they want you to see if they, if you know how a vertical lookup works. Because it, if you don't understand how vertical lookups work, it kind of shows uh, the employer that you have a certain level of knowledge. I'll be using this function a lot during this course, and this will be your first exposure to it. So in chapter two, they want you to see how vertical lookup works. So V lookup means vertical lookup, which means go to a table and look up something. So here's a table. And what we're trying to do is we're going to look up here for a particular percentage, and then we're going to look up what the value is. All right. So how it works is, let me double click it. It says, let's look up the percentage. So it's, I'm putting down 20%. So it says right here, let's go back in. It's going to look at the first argument. The first argument is let's look up something. What are we trying to look up? I'm trying to look up the CMHC percentage on what? So I'm going to look up the percentage right here. I'm paying 20%. So let's look it up. The next thing I'm going to do, or the next part of the argument is this one right here, is a range. Where's the table that you're looking up? Well, the, the table is right here, is these two lines, these two columns right here. I'm looking up these numbers in this column, and I'm looking it up vertically. So that's why they use the V, because you're going vertically this way. Sometimes you have tables that go this way, which would be an H lookup. In this case, it's a vertical lookup. All right, and from there, it says, what column do you want to display? Well, I want to look up this 20% in here, and there it is there, and I want to display what's in the second column. I want that number, 2.4%. And that's what I get, 2.4%. So that's how vertical lookup works. Now let's, let's, let's test this. Let's put in 10% and see if we get 3.1. So I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to type in 10%. And I'm going to go down here. And sure enough, I got 3.1%. So by me changing and making different decisions here with this table, I can dynamically, quantitatively, instantly find out what that answer is without having to go look it up myself. This saves a lot of time. And in a sense, it's kind of like a, a conditional statement because as I change my data here, it compares it against all of these conditions and it finds the answer it wants that you want. All right, let's have a look at, okay, so at 10% here, and let's go down, back down here. There we go. Let's go down to the next one here. Now, you'll notice that my um, calculations, if, if I have a, a large down payment, let's say I put down 25%, 25% has nothing in here. I, there's no down payment if I have 25%. So you'll notice here, well, let's go 20, let's go 26%. Try that. It's still, okay, well, let's keep going here. I gotta check my math here, 30%. We're still at, and that is that because if I have 30% here, I should not have. So I need to add another, oh, I know, I need to add a zero. I need to have another one here that's zero. So the down payment over 25%, is zero there we go and then there we go that's zero perfect so let's go back into my 20 percent and that should now be 2.4 but if i go 21 percent uh sorry 25 percent that should be zero perfect uh, kind of got complicated there but i hope you, you get what i'm doing here um and then to calculate how much money that you owe would be based on the percentage. So if it's zero, of course, you're not going to pay anything. So I'm going to put down um, 15% so I can come up with my 2.8. And to calculate 2.8% uh, multiplied by my mortgage amount. Now, if you take a look at my formula, it's starting to look kind of complicated. This is another one of the learning objective formulas called um, 
the if statement. And the if statement is just such an important uh, function in Excel because it allows the computer to make a decision based on a criteria or a condition or a test. And how it works is that the function itself is called if, and then from there you have to be able to write a condition, a logical test. Logical tests are usually in the form of a comparison between two separate values. Now you can compare the values using a logical operator. Logical operators are things like greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to, or just less than, or greater than or less than, which is not equal to. So there's a whole variety of these. And we'll get into these more as we progress through the course. So this will be your first exposure to this condition statement. All right, so what, what I'm saying here is I'm saying, let's take a C9, which is the 15%, because I'm really trying to figure out if, if the value is greater than 20%, okay, so ask yourself, is 15% greater than or equal to, to 20%? Is that true or false? Well, that's false. 15% is less than, so the, the condition fails. If you read the arguments here, the second argument is if it was true, then it would perform everything that was coded into this argument. If it's false, it would be co everything that was coded into the third argument. So arguments are separated by commas. So let's review. The first argument is the logical test. The second argument right here is if it's true. And the third argument is if it's false. So if it's true, I'm going to put in a quote, quote. Well, quote, quote just means put everything that's between the quotes, which is absolutely nothing. So you're, you're quoting nothing, meaning that if you're over 20% or equal to 20%, then don't, you don't have to worry about CMHC because uh, the rules don't apply. It's only if you put less than 20% down on your mortgage that you need to pay. So what if it's 15% like this? Well, if it's 15%, we have to perform this argument which means take C12, which is the mortgage that, you, that you're applying for, and you're multiplying it by the interest rate that CMHC is gonna charge. And we push enter, it says $7,527, So what we've done here is by building this system, we can type in a percentage rate that we want to pay for a property. And based on that percentage, we'll have a drastic impact on how much you have to pay for CMHC. Okay, so let's go back to 20%. So I've got, I must have an error in here because I've got, oh, here it is, 20% is 2.4, there we go. But even if I go 21%, it still should, that, should, that shouldn't be, oh, I think because it's, uh, yeah, it's the range of, okay, right. So the way I've written this, so I should probably put this down as 21%. And then anything over 20% is zero. That's what it is. Perfect. Fix that up. All right. So now you could try to work, you know, if you, if you come up with a larger down payment, you, you don't have to pay that extra amount. But if you don't have as much money, like 15%, you've got to come up with an extra $7,500 to buy the insurance. All right, another variable uh, that I've got in here is the years. And, and I've got it in here twice. So I've got this one here and I've got one here. Um, so it's probably not a good idea to do that. So I probably want to take this one out. But I want to make sure that my formulas don't ref refer to this one. If they do refer to this one, well, then I'll have to update them. Uh, the other option would be for me to just simply go equal to the 25 up here. But from a design point, you don't want to enter data in twice. And these two are exactly the same. So we definitely don't want to do that. Term or a number of years means how many years you're going to take to pay this mortgage back. Now you can type in anywhere from one year up to 25 years. Now there is some cases where they allow 30, but it's not as common. Um, in the US, they allow for 30 years, I believe. But in Canada, they, they, the banks, they kind of think that 25 is the maximum that you should target for. So that's why I have 
25 in here. If I lower that amount, or I should say this amount here, because that's where my formulas are based, it impacts how much my monthly mortgage is going to be. So the shorter the term, the higher I pay each month. So because it's, you know, I want to get my, my mortgage payment to the lowest, I want to put down 25. But remember, you're paying for an additional five more years of your life to pay that mortgage off. All right, so this one right here, I probably don't need. So I could probably just either uh, delete it or I could right click on the row number and say delete. There we go. All right, so let's go down and summarize what we've been doing. So we've got the, the first mortgage, which is um, calculated based on how much we're going to take out from the bank, what the interest rate is, what the term is, and also our frequency of payment per year. So how do we calculate our monthly mortgage? Well, our monthly mortgage is by using a built-in function. Excel does this very well. And for us to kind of calculate uh, the, the payments would be, um, from a formula point of view, it is quite complicated. So to make things easier, Excel has a function, a financial function called PMT. Now we can get the PMT by typing in PMT or here on the um, insert function or FX, we can click here. This is another way to do it. So this brings up a wizard to help us build a function. So instead of typing the arguments into brackets, we can type them into this form. So I'll use this as an example uh, for here. All right, so how does it work? Well, it's, it asks the question, what is your rate? Well, my rate is, and I go down here, I go to C13, it's 1.32. Then I'm going to divide the rate because that's an APR, that's the annual percentage rate. I want to I want to break it down to my frequency of payments per year, which is 12. Now I've hard coded a 12 here, and it's bad practice to hard code if you've got a cell reference. So I'd rather just type in the cell reference. So the formula should read this rate divided by this. And that's the actual percentage rate in the fractional amount each month. Now, if I change my, my number here from 12 to 26, my calculations are automatically updated properly. All right, let's move on to the next one. What's the N per? N per is the number of periods that you're needing to pay back the mortgage. Now, what does that, how many do we need to pay back? Well, we're gonna calculate it based on the number of years. So there's 25 years multiply it by 12 times per year. Again, I don't want to put in a hard code a number because I might want to change that when I have it referenced here in my spreadsheet. So I'm going to type in that. Oh, let's go back here and read type in the whole thing. So my number of periods would be 25 years multiplied by 12. All right. And then finally, the last one is the present value. What is the present value of how much you're trying to borrow? What's the amount? And you can see here my, my HSBC bank uh, mortgage would be $268,750. And I'm done. It tells me down here, before I push OK, what the answer is going to be. So I'm going to have to pay $1,052.25. And sure enough, that's what it comes up with right there. That's for my first mortgage. Now we repeat the process for the second mortgage. You think in the second mortgage. The second mortgage would be the mortgage that you're paying back to family or friends, or maybe the bank you want had to get a second mortgage from the bank or from other some other person. We want to basically go through the same process. Now let's try doing the same function, but this time we'll we'll use um, the the actual function um, inside the cell rather than the insert function option. All right, now to do that, let's go equal to PMT bracket and ask yourself what the rate is. Well, the rate's right there. So we can use this rate if that was the agreed rate that we were paying back um, or our second mortgage. But remember the rate is an annual percentage rate or APR. So we have to divide that by how many periods are we going to break it up per year? So payments per year would be here. All right, now the number of times you're gonna have to pay this back would be 25 years times 12 months, 12 times per year, comma, let's go to the third argument, which is the present value. What's the present value of the second mortgage? Well, that one's right here. So your 
You're going to put down your second mortgage right there, and you're done. It has two more arguments here, and they're in square brackets. The square brackets denote that these functions, or arguments, I should say, sorry, arguments, are optional. So you don't need to put them in. FV stands for the future value if you want to have a balance owing. And type is, uh, do you want to pay at the beginning of the month or at the end of the month? So you can ignore those two for now because those are more specialty variables or arguments. And I push enter. And it says here that I have to pay an extra $195 to pay back the second mortgage. All right. So now we know how much our mortgage is going to be, how much our second is going to be. We also have to calculate what the other expenses to purchase this property is. Another one's called the strata fee. Now the strata fee is really not an optional amount. We do need to enter it in, but we can't elect what it is. So that's not going to help us much. So what I'm going to do now is go back to my property. Okay, so here's the property right here. And I'm going to go down to the maintenance and strata fee, which is right there. All right, perfect. So I'm going to type that in right here. Now you'll notice also I put in a negative here. So I'm entering my, my data as minus because I'm spending my strata fee. So I want to know what it is coming out of my pocket. Another fee that you should put in when you're calculating is what is your monthly utility bills? Banks incorporate this because they want to know how much you're going to spend for all of this. So I'm going to estimate. This one right here is an estimate and I could probably get away with doing this right here because it might only be $60. It really, oops, minus $60. It really could vary. Now, something that um, we also need to put in is our, our property taxes. So our property taxes are calculated, um, uh, well, by the, by the municipality. But if we go back, you'll see here that the, the property taxes are $1,822 for that property. So what I'm going to do here is I've got the property tax right there as well, is I want to calculate what the monthly amount for property taxes are going to be. All right. So I'll calculate that by taking my amount per year and I subtract it from the property grant. So the government does give you back a little bit of money if you live in the property as your prime residence. And that's another calculation. And then we have to divide it by 12 because we want to know how much it's going to cost us per month. So again, that number should be negative, that whole amount. So what I should probably do is I should put a negative in front of my whole formula to turn it into a negative. There we go. <laughs> By that one little negative right there, it completely throws off my value, turns it into a positive. That's not, the city's not paying me to, for taxes. I got to pay the taxes. <laughs> so I'm going to put a negative up here, changing it from a positive to a negative. Perfect. All right, so what I've got now is the true or a pretty accurate calculation of how much money it's going to cost me to pay every month now, uh, at least at the beginning. Of course, things change. Stratus go, strata fees go up over time. Mortgage rates can go up over time. Property taxes can go up over time. But in the first month or year, you're looking at approximately $1,864 per month to purchase this property if you put down a 15% as a first, you put down another 50,000 and you also put down 7,000 in expenses. All right. Oh, and in this case scenario, another 7,500 in um, CMHC. So you can see the level of, you know, quantitative analysis that we're doing here, this more of a deep dive to be more accurate. Now I carry this on a little further and I want to know, is there a possibility to generate revenue from this? Now that means that could I rent out a room? Maybe because it's close to Douglas College, maybe you could rent a room out to a student for $700 a month, bring in some money. So what maybe, and I put in two rooms just in case I had a large, you know, a, a scenario had more than two bedrooms, for example. Let's say I wanted to rent out one of the rooms for $700 to a student. Okay, you, you can add that as income towards your expenses. So how does that work? Well, I simply just take um, all of my income here. So I take C, possibly C, um, oh, C, this one's right. I take my total expenses, 1865 
or 64 as and then add it because it's a negative I want to add it to my positive add it to a positive add it to a positive so it calculates basically the 1865 minus seven hundred dollars so at the end of the month I only need to pay eleven hundred and sixty five dollars or approximately if I can rent for this a lot of ifs going on here and again that's another calculation that I have control over now if I want to work out and this is another very important calculation is how much is your housing costing you relative to your income and this is a calculation banks look at very carefully so you should know what it is so what I've done here is I've simply just put in a basic calculation of how much your salary might be so let's say you make you gross thirty five hundred dollars per month we want to calculate uh, oh and also we want to know what the net is now this is again a very crude um, calculation because I simply just put in 18% in deductions off my salary for paying taxes and EI and all those different deductions they take off our paychecks so they take off let's say six hundred and thirty dollars so we want to work out what is our net income how much do we have to spend and you may, may remember from our budget from last week or from chapter one we talked about that about having net dollars to spend and in our budget and then from there I come up with what I call the house cost ratio that means how much do you actually spend on housing or compared to your net income so in this analysis we've come up with approximately 40 percent of our net income goes towards housing which is quite high I think banks really like to see your net income around 25 to 30 percent although right now with the housing market it's so expensive that's very difficult um, that a lot of people are having to um, you know raise that ratio all right so that's kind of a fairly quick analysis on how that works showing examples of how financial functions work and such as the PMT how the vertical lookup look works and to calculate the CMHC and how to do an, a conditional statement which is an if statement uh, we could carry this analysis on even further to analyze things like what our mortgage rate could be now what I've done here is I've simply put in a payment formula as if we were gonna pick this mortgage and I did the same thing here so to do this um, calculation if you look at it has a lot of you know cell references and also these dollar signs so in chapter two they talk about absolute and relative cell referencing and let me explain how it works so I want to calculate basically all of this so I'm gonna take that out and we'll redo it from scratch I want to know how much my monthly payment would be if I selected this option or this one which one do you select well one variable you should know is how much you're gonna spend so let's calculate that let's calculate the payment so I'm gonna take the rate and there's the rate right there and I'm going to divide it by my term my my number of times per because it's an annual percentage rate then I'm going to multiply it by the 25 percent and I'm going to um, multiply that by the number here comma and then the, the actual amount I'm borrowing is 268 and push enter looks good all right perfect but here's the problem if I copy this down look what happens it's a mess you think well what happened well when I copied this down it took the the blue reference cell of G10 here and it moved down to here well I don't want that plus it took C15 right here and moved it down to 50,000 well that's gonna mess everything up drastically so the function I have here is um, it works for a one-time calculation so I would have to go back and manually do that same calculation four more times now if you think about it, if you had to do this a hundred or a thousand times this would take you days so you have to understand how the concept of absolute and end cell referencing works otherwise you just wouldn't be very good at, at Excel again this is another very important concept that they usually test on when you go for a job interview all right so here's how it works I want to go back in here and I want to ask myself 
if I drop my formula from H10 down to H11, do I want this to go down to this from 1.83 down to 1.94? I do. So this one's going to be relative. I want this function to be relative to this one. I want this one to be relative to this. I don't touch that. But C15 is, I'm always referring to C15 as I'm copied down. I want that to be absolute. To make something absolute, you can put a dollar sign at the beginning of the column and a dollar sign in front of the row. That will lock it in and it, it won't change. Now, let's do the same thing for C14. C14, again, I want to lock it in. Every one of these is going to be 25 years. So instead of typing a dollar sign here and a dollar sign there, all I have to do is press the F4 key. F4 automatically puts it in. In fact, it's this is such a common feature, they've dedicated a function key to it, the F4. Now, moving over to this one, I want to take the, um, again, C15, I want to lock it in. I want to make it absolute. So I'm going to push F4. And finally, C12, I want to lock in. So if you look at the function now, it, I have one relative and the rest of these are absolute. So what the, the answer is still the same, but when I copy down now, it works for all of them. It's a very smooth process. This is such an important idea that we're going to be talking about this more and more as we progress. And chapter two also teaches this. So when you're going through the simulated environment with my IT lab, they'll be explaining how the absolute and relative works. Now there's another one called mixed, which I will, I will save for another class. And it's basically mixed. Just a quick tip on mixed is you can either have the whole thing absolute, or you can have just the row absolute or, or just the column absolute, or you can have it relative. So there's actually four states. There's relative, absolute, mixed column, or this is mixed row and mixed column. So there's four different states of cell referencing. In my case, I want both. All right, so there we go. We got that set up. And what that does is it gives me a better understanding of what I'm gonna pay per month. So you look down the list and you think, well, it's, let's pick the cheapest one, right? Let's pick the five-year variable closed rate. It's only $1,052. Why would I pick this one here at $1,241? right? That's a lot of money. So in fact, I can calculate how much that's going to cost me. So if I calculate this, I can calculate on a, on a two year um, calculation that says, well, let's take this amount and compare it against the 10 year. And I would save $3,000 by picking this rate. I say 2,700 and this one's 4,500. You think, well, that's, you definitely want to pick this one here, but there is risk in this. There's risk to this and there's there's pros and cons to each of these. So that's that would be I'd have to reserve that for a completely different lecture. Um, but what Excel is doing for you is it's able to calculate these things so that you can make better decisions. If you don't do this, if you don't understand this, you could pick a rate that's going to cost you, uh, you know, four thousand five hundred dollars more than another rate. But then there's risk involved. So it's a, it's a balancing act, but that's what the whole point of this exercise was to do is to enter all your variables, use your formulas, use your functions to do a, a proper quantitative analysis. So I hope this has made sense for you guys uh, to this point. And uh, I hope you went through this exercise. Uh, you can pause it and go back and forth. If you have any questions, um, um, I'm available on Fridays in my office hours. So Friday at uh, 12 o'clock until one o'clock, I'm online. The link is in the Blackboard site. Just uh, feel free to jump online and ask questions. Uh, you can always send me emails as well. All right, so that's it for chapter number two, and I'll see you guys next week.